now, but for those of you I have yet to meet, I'm Valerie DaCosta. I'm the program manager of InfoDev that is uh, convening the Global Forum here in Helsinki. And um, just judging from all of the interactions I've been seeing, uh, this really is, I think, one of our most successful events with well over uh, 600 people from 90 countries here. So this is a premier opportunity to engage and interact with uh, counterparts from around the world on themes of technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation. But from the perspective of activism and from the perspective of getting activities done on the ground uh, to engage and empower uh, an innovative, technology-oriented SME community. And so really that's the governing force that brings us all here together as a confluence in Helsinki. One thing I just want to share with you is that from the time that we began to construct our network of small business incubators, which currently numbers about 350 um, around the world, so it's therefore the largest uh, of, its, uh, of its kind in the developing world, uh, InfoDev has now started to grow its vista and grow its perspective to include not just the process and the uh, the expertise behind incubating small business or nurturing or growing small business, but then trying to follow them on the technology entrepreneur journey uh, in a post-incubation environment. And for that, we know very well that the two challenges that the technology SME community and innovative startup community tell us uh, in developing countries, the two biggest challenges are effective policy engagement with the, um, with the governments that help to set the business enabling environment, number one. And number two really is this uh, technology financing gap. The uh, difficulty for SMEs uh, in the technology space to gain access to appropriate flexible financing uh, instruments. So that second issue is what led us to convene this panel today, which I think is actually a blue ribbon panel and I've been waiting for this discussion all week. Uh, uh, this is uh, the first of its kind that we've convened to try to begin to flesh out what the challenge is to finance companies uh, in this particular segment uh, and to brainstorm solutions for how the World Bank, uh, together with our partners at, uh, at the IFC, can fashion uh, appropriate solutions. So who better to uh, moderate this panel than a very uh, good friend of mine and a colleague of mine for now four years. Uh, he's such a close colleague, I had to get his business card to read his title because I forgot what it was. But uh, this is Kent Loopberger. He's the global head of technology, media, and telecom uh, for Global Infrastructure and Natural Resources Department of the International Finance Corporation. And so I hand the, uh, the floor over to Kent to moderate this panel. Thanks, Kent. Thank you, Valerie. I mean, one reason she doesn't re know my title is we went through a reorganization. Prior to that reorganization, we were one group, and I think it, we, we had a lot of value out of that one group. We had our bank, policy, po our bank colleagues working in ICT, working with governments on the policy side to create the enabling environment, you had InfoDev working with early stage companies with their incubator process, et cetera. <clears throat> and then you had IFC, who's the private sector side of the World Bank, or the side of the World Bank working with the private sector trying to do sustainable business. And when I talk about sustainable business, it's, it's from our underlying principle is we want to create financially sustainable businesses. That's number one. Then we have multiple objectives on top of that, that they adopt international best practice in environment, social practices, corporate governance. Now we're looking at things uh, in terms of the carbon footprint of our projects and what can be done to reduce that. So multiple objectives. It's my pleasure hosting this, this, this moderating this panel today because the subject matter is really one of the problem, one of the areas where we've struggled. As, it, as it, uh, Valerie said, InfoDes has successfully created 350 incubators, mobile application labs, and climate innovation centers. They're creating these, these centers. These centers are creating businesses. And then what? 
there is a lack of financing. You know, and there, that lack of financing usually persists until the first or second stage of institutional investors. And that is generally, generically known in the industry as the valley of death. One reason I'm excited about moderating this panel today is we have a number of, of participants on this panel that actually are working in this sector and are trying to address these issues. So I want to hear from them what they're doing, what they're doing right, where they see the challenges, and what can institutions like IFC, the World Bank, and others do to help promote this sector. Just in terms of background, as I mentioned on the, on the, on the side of IFC, we've been working um, doing early stage investments for the last 10 years, having done directly roughly 60 plus, mostly in IT and more recently in clean tech. And we actually just last fall created a, a, a unit dedicated to early stage clean tech investment. Since the 1980s, we've been investing in funds. These historically originally were country funds, but increasingly are uh, specialized industry funds. And for example, in my group right now, we're looking at, 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 at three or four uh, IT or TMT funds around the world. Um, as I say, we refer to ourselves as venture capitalists, but we're really growth uh, capitalists, growth investors, which is what you more often than not see in the industry. We and so many others don't want to start out, or we don't, we're not that good at investing in the early, early stage companies. IFC specifically is not that good at assessing technologies. That's not our skill set. What we want to do and what most so-called venture capital or growth capital <coughs> investors look for are, are companies that have some a product or, or, or service they've created, have already started marketing that, marketing that, and then the challenge is scaling that up. But again, going back, the problem is, is the time before that. As I say, we re usually refer to ourselves as a Series B investor. Um, more often than not, Series B would be the second institutional round. In some cases, we will go into the Series A when we see something highly innovative or developmental that we want to try out. But the reality is, if you look at our success rate, our, our, our greatest failures are in the earliest stage companies. What we really would like to be looking about this company with this panel today is that early stage funding that comes out. You know, the, the hundred thousand to a million, two million dollars. What what can be done on that? The reality is, as I say, we have not IFC found a way to do this successfully, directly or indirectly. We actually had a lunch with the, these panelists yesterday where we're kicking around ideas on this, and, and, and hopefully we'll be exploring that uh, further. Um, I think what I'd like to do is now pass it over to the panel. The idea is to have roughly 10 minutes per panelist discuss what they're doing, um, what works, what doesn't work, and then be, have a, roughly a half an hour, 20 minutes at the end to open up for questions. Um, I will not be following the order you see on, that, on, the, on, on the program above. I'll rather the order of these individuals. Uh, the first speaker would be Osama Fayad, who's executive chairman of Oasis 500. Based in Jordan, Oasis 500 is the MENAS region's premier early stage and seed investment program, which includes entrepreneurship training, mentorship, incubation, and follow-on and angel investment funds. Osama? Uh, th thank you, Kent. Uh, it's funny, li listening to you, you know, when, when he started saying early stage, he couldn't get himself to, to go below the 100,000 threshold. He said 100,000 to a million. Um, I actually believe, and in fact, it's something we tell our entrepreneurs is, I've heard the story of, I need 200,000, I need 500,000, I need a million. And I have a standard answer to it, which is, if you're going to spend a million dollars, you're first going to spend the first $15,000. So tell me how. Uh, and that's how we work. Um, Oasis 500 is uh, it's a unique 
uh, it's a unique project for the, for the MENA region. Uh, in a sense, it's an attempt at uh, kick-starting the process of uh, early-stage companies forming. We, we believe, uh, and especially in Jordan, there is a population of people with ideas, and they have motivation. Right? They don't have a lot of job options. They have a pretty good education. Um, and they go nowhere with these ideas because they have sort of a defined unemployment path or employment path, and then you know, they leave the country kind of thing. So when I was asked to say, you know, how do we get more startups to happen uh, in the MENA region in general and, and in Jordan, starting with Jordan, the first thing I looked at, you know, my background is, is uh, being a scientist before I, I became a serial entrepreneur. The first thing I looked at is what are the gaps? And the first thing uh, I learned is that there is no, literally no, seed or early stage investment funds in the entire Middle East and North Africa region. And that's the region I looked at. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world. I know what it's like in the US, where that's definitely not the case. So the picture is uh, somebody with an idea will borrow, beg, etc., get money from friends and family, start a business, uh, quickly run out of those funds, and that's it. Uh, so they, they never survive that, that, I call it a desert rather than a valley of death. Um, and that's why we created the concept of Oasis, right, to address the desert. The 500 is an ambitious goal that we set, which is can we actually fund 500 companies, help start, fund and accelerate 500 companies in five years? Uh, the reason we picked 500 is really by design to shock the system. Because I believe that you know, if, if you do 100 in five years or 200, yeah, maybe you'll have a nice positive impact, but it's not really going to you know, give you that shock therapy that you need. Whether the, you know, the patient wakes up or not is a different story. Um, so, in identifying the needs, we said, fine, it's not just about funding now. Uh, if I give some people funding, do they know what to do with it? Well, it turns out, no. Most of them don't understand the basic concepts of what a business is, what it takes to run it, the fact that you need a team, you know, what is marketing, what is sales. You know, this is a typical entrepreneur. I'm everything. I do everything. Uh, and that's you know, a formula for uh, running into the wall in, in no time. Um, so we created a training boot camp, which, in fact, I... Uh, worried about a lot, because training, as, as you all know, is extremely expensive, uh, especially if you want to do it well. Um, so, we, and, and after the training, we have a stage where we invest in companies, and we start with $15,000 for three months or 100 days. After that, they become eligible for follow-on funding of 50 to 100,000, and then later to the uh, uh, angel investors through an angel network that we form. So we had to create an angel network because the region also doesn't have a culture of angel investment in technology companies. And I should say we're focused on ICT, digital media, and um, uh, mobile technologies. And that's partly because I understand that space and partly because I think that's a space where people can create markets that are regional or global. Uh, you know, Jordan is a small country. The, the Middle East in general you know, is, is a much larger market that can be addressed and the world, of course. So let me, uh, the best way to describe this, and, and by the way, along the line, we have to do mentorship uh, in a region that historically hasn't had a tradition of business people mentoring sort of strangers, that they'll mentor family or their own companies. Um, so we created also a mentor network. So there's four things, right? The boot camp for training, investment and acceleration, mentorship, mentor network, and angel network. So now that we've been in operation for eight months and we've tried uh, the entire cycle, uh, we've trained five waves uh, of, of entrepreneurs. We started out with uh, a wave being 30 companies. The demand was so high that we grew our waves from 30 to 60. Uh, when I came up with my Excel sheet model saying, here's how we're going to hit 500 companies in five years, I modeled that 50% of these companies are not going to survive the boot camp. And we designed it to drop them off. Uh, in fact, it turned out 90% of them survive it, and the quality was much higher. So the yield, the percent of companies that I invest in after the boot camp, is much higher than we modeled. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about those results in a sec. Uh, so that's the boot camp. Uh, we did the accelerator, and the accelerator is a, it's a very nice formula. 
When you enter, the final pitch you make, you do a whole bunch of pitches as part of the boot camp till you learn how to talk to investors. And I won't invest in you, or we won't invest in you, unless we believe you can talk to investors and attract capital. We don't expect you to attract it. We just want to make sure you can talk, tell the story, etc. The last story you have to tell in a 10-minute pitch is, here is how I'm going to spend the $15,000 over the next 100 days. And we turn that into a contract, so we both sign it. And we actually keep our entrepreneurs to the contract. We check in with them weekly. We make them present to each other monthly. Uh, and that, th those uh, goals were designed aspirationally to say, if you achieve all these milestones that we both agree on, then I think, as an investor, I think your valuation should go up by a factor of three. And I'll tell you the, the results of that, too, in, in these short months. Uh, we did a mentor network, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about the results there. We just invited people and had them uh, listen to short pitches. And uh, to my surprise, we had four mentors sign up for each company. And signing up for a company means you, growing, you commit to spend two hours a week with them for four weeks. Uh, these are CEOs of companies that are busy, you know, doing other stuff. Um, uh, and I'll talk about the uh, Angel Network uh, uh, results in a second. So what, what, what have been the surprises? And I'll, I'll shut up after that. I had four major surprises, you know, coming from Silicon Valley and, and going to a place like Jordan. The first one was the amount of demand, you know, how much people wanted to go through this training and how, how much, and it's free, by the way. So that it's not like a major investment on their part. They stuck through it. I modeled 50% dropping off, 90% made it through. Um, they learned a lot, and we evolved a pretty unique program. The acceleration, um, we've invested so far, uh, and here's, here's our statistic that I'm proud of. My model was year one, we are going to invest in 10 companies. So far, we have invested in 15, and we have in the pipeline right now being evaluated another uh, 20, probably 8 to 12 will get an investment. So we'll wind up year one probably at three times our investment goal, uh, two times our training goal, uh, just, just because of the demand. Uh, the mentor network, I mentioned that success. And finally, the angel network, which is sort of almost the proof of the pudding, right? The, 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 final, the final, final proof is when you get exits and you get returns. But seven, eight months into it, here's what I can tell you. Uh, even though we set the goal aggressively for the 100-day program, even though those guys worked very hard uh, and met the goals, I didn't expect that the market would be ready to sort of step up and say, okay, we'll give you three times the valuation. I thought, you know, if they got one and a half times, two times, that would be a success. Uh, all of our companies from the Angel Network event that we held two weeks ago, which attracted, by the way, 80 investors, a third of them from outside Jordan who flew to Jordan, uh, from uh, the, the Gulf countries, from North Africa and actually from Turkey and uh, uh, Belgium and England and the US. Um, all companies got investment offers and here is the kicker. Each one of them got an investment offer at three times to seven times the valuation that we entered at three months before or not 100 days before. So these companies, it's been you know, an, an amazing pleasure not just to train them, but to see that if they actually follow the formula, if they follow the, the high growth, work hard formula with milestones that make sense, they can actually raise their valuations. And they had real metrics, like companies that we invested in, not all of them are pure startups. Some of them have been in the market two years. For two years, they'd be flat on revenues and profitability. Those 100 days at Oasis 500, two of them tripled their revenue in 100 days. And that was purely because we actually forced them to strategize about their business. We forced them to think about it in numbers, and we forced them to focus on the parts that made sense. Uh, so, so far, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it, and uh, uh, we're raising a $6 million fund. We have about $4 million of the $6 million in place. That's going to be enough for two years and fund 200, 120 companies. Uh, over the lifetime of five years, we'll probably raise $25 million. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move from Jordan to Argentina. Very close. Very close. <laughs> the word has flattened. <laughs> uh, Lissandro Brill, he's a pioneer venture capitalist and entrepreneur development activist who's been active in Argentina since the 1990s. He's a managing partner of Axe Partners, which is the management of PMAR Fund, 
The fund is dedicated to foster venture capital investments in early stage expansion businesses that have their innovation in Argentina and target regional and or global markets. Lissandro? Uh, thank you, Kent. And uh, when I was invited to this conference, uh, I was asked to, to share with you my perspective on how to solve the equity gap in early stage financing. And different from Usama that has dedicated this specific task in emerging markets the last year or two, uh, I have been very successful as I learned here in Finland, success means you fail, you fail, you fail. That means without losing enthusiasm, that's success. <laughs> <laughs> During the last 20 years in Argentina. <laughs> and uh, the ignition to dedicate my life and passion and interest and business interest to this uh, matter came after my frustration when I was in late 80s uh, Secretary of the Nation for Foreign Trade, doing expert promotion. And I wanted to foster people that would export talent that the country has. And the consistent story was, well, listen, I have in my balance sheet, master's degree, PhD degree. I have this great idea. I go to the bank. There is no money there. The, and I do not have collaterals. So the commercial banking system is not designed for this. And, uh, and I thought, well, something has to be done to finance people that has ideas, passion for entrepreneurship, and want to, to develop a business. When I was living in the States with my graduate uh, degree, this was something easy there in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I had classmates that had these ideas, came out from school, and put, there were people putting money there without asking for collateral. And I, was, I thought that this was an eccentricity of the United States. <laughs> so I came back to Argentina, and uh, I started to develop my, my practice in, uh, first in government, afterwards in management consulting. And, uh, and I was frustrated because really I saw that the talented people of Argentina, and Argentina is a very, very, very entrepreneurial country, uh, is ranked by, by GEM, the, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, among the top 5% of entrepreneurship activity. During the 90s, for example, half of the venture-backed companies in the internet era uh, were from Argentina. Uh, so the entrepreneurship drive was there, the money was not there, the capital wasn't there. So I started late uh, 90s now to see how to promote this. And uh, well, I saw, well, we have to cre recreate somehow the entrepreneurial venture back ecosystem that I saw existed in the States. At that time, two youngsters from America, Peter Kerner and Linda Rottenberg, show up in Buenos Aires and say, we want to create a foundation dedicated to promote entrepreneurship in emerging markets. Uh, Endeavor was the name. And, uh, and we want to focus in high-impact entrepreneurs because we see that the leverage really for economic development is the entrepreneurial drive of a community. And I say entrepreneurial, right? The focus was on entrepreneurs. And really endeavored to make a contribution. And Argentina was the first country in the world to have an, an endeavor organization put in place. And we started to evangelize the culture of entrepreneurship, high impact, venture backed. Imagine we knocked the door of a technology entrepreneur at that time. We said, well, we come here because we want to venture back a company with venture capital because you have technology that can be sold in the world and so on. And the assistant that was at the reception is go to the entrepreneur and say, well, listen, here there are some crazy people. I do not understand very much what they say. It seems to me that it's something like adventure tourism in <laughs> southern Patagonia. <laughs> 
So in many countries, communicating what venture capital is about is really a challenging thing to do, depending on which stage of the ecosystem you, you are. And, and I would say that really uh, Endeavor has made a significant contribution in helping creating this language, culture, what's an angel network, what angels are for, smart money. I remember the entrepreneurs saying, well, listen, Lisandro, when you come from Endeavor and you want to do venture, you want to do venture capital, listen, I understand the part that you say money. Uh, that means, have you seen something green with Washington in the middle? That's a dollar, that's money, I understand this. What are you willing to tell me with smart? What's a smart component? And really the key success factor in order to have real ignition of entrepreneurs moving upwards is money partially, but basically it was Osama is doing, which is a, the smart component of helping people to really escalate from an idea into a structured business, high growth path. And recreating this is a challenge which is not uh, easy to do, it's not an easy task. And uh, my, my perception is that I, I'm exaggerating, but, but I am convinced that the competitive advantage of nations is not about natural resources, it's about having an entrepreneurial, high impact, high growth uh, cluster of people that really will drive the country towards a, a different new level of, of development. I was successful late 90s in structuring my first venture fund with American investors. And we said, well, we are going to do hands-on in hands investments and, um, and, and we always position my, I always position myself as a, as a smart hands-on manager, doing a lot of the mentoring and a lot of the coaching for the early stage uh, entrepreneurs where we wanted to invest. But it's clearly that from the venture capital perspective, having a fund that invests, let's say, half a million dollars, $300,000 to $2 million, these are the numbers, in, at least in my country, um, um, you need deal inflow. And the deal inflow, which is the raw material for venture-backed companies, which is the model, the venture capital model is clear, the early stage accelerator model still, for me at least, is not clear. Uh, it's something that is needed. And, and for this reason, in my current fund, uh, PIMAR, we have decided and take the decision of really investing a part of the fund, let's say two, three million dollars, in an accelerator like Usama is describing. Uh, I have tempted Usama yesterday to come to Argentina. He wants to stay in Jordan and his children learning Arabic after having a successful life in the States. But, uh, but really the key success factor of having these accelerators uh, being uh, in place and, um, and really do the job is not the real estate, is not the university that uh, has the infrastructure. All this is already there. The critical success factors is how do we identify the Usamas that will run these processes and by his own presence that comes with huge human capital of a network really creates the trust to put the system to work. So the key focus is not in the project for me, is not in the infrastructure, is in who are the people that really lead this process, what are their qualifications, and what's their background. And believe me, it's much more difficult to find Osamas or Raouls than, having, than uh, finding a CFO for a private equity fund that manages $1 billion. You go to a headhunter and you find these people. There is no headhunter that can find easily this type of, of profiles, and that's part of the challenge. Uh, I am wrapping up, and 
really would say that uh, I am very, very uh, enthusiastic after these meetings, and really I congratulate InfoDev and World Bank and IFC because I see from Valerie and his, her team and Devan and his team the attitude to really address the issue to make it happen. And now Valerie, and I call her the, the queen of the InfoDev, <laughs> that came here with 50 children, successful entrepreneurs of their own respective countries, she is now becoming a victim of her success in the sense that if she, we don't find the finding for the successful people that we, we are, have identified now, and really there are clear signs that there are 20 high growth impact entrepreneurs here, uh, the whole machinery that has been put in place will die because the water, the financing to follow up this success needs to be in place. And so, really, if Helsinki will be reminded as the innovative, uh, and I feel the atmosphere, everything here in Helsinki is mobile and innovative. I thought this was a very stable society, but everything is mobile and innovative. Uh, will be reminded as the having been the place where the synergetic effort and brainstorming has created this business model, uh, we have done our job. Thank you. Thank you, Lissandro. Thank you. Now you can see why I was excited about hosting this panel by the quality of the participants. I think that the, the, uh, we talk a lot about the, the, the lack of money, but we're seeing it's much more than that. Uh, I think our next speaker is, is also dealing with early stage. His name is Murat Akti Hanoglu, uh, very good Anglo-Saxon name, <laughs> um, actually a Turkish-American based out of New York. Uh, ER Accelerator, uh, for which he's managing director, is a startup incubator launched in New York City, which is an early stage investment firm that funds and aims to build the next generation of leading technology, media, and internet companies. ER Accelerator helps startup companies succeed with a combination of hands-on help, seed capital, and know-how. Right? Thank you, Ken. Um, this is it's a great uh, place. And yesterday we had a discussion with the panelists and some more people, and it was very useful. So I'd like to thank InfoDev and World Bank and IFC, everybody, for putting this together. Now, I have a quick question. How many entrepreneurs do we have here in, right now? Okay, great. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a software engineer. I don't have a finance background or MBA, but um, I've been starting companies for over um, 15 years. And um, I'm originally from Turkey. I lived in the US for the past 18 years. And I lived in California, I worked at Silicon Valley. And then I moved to New York around 12 years ago. And in New York, I realized that, you know, when you go to a startup event, the event was mostly standing in a crowded bar, holding a beer bottle, and then just going home after that. So four years ago, I said, you know, let's uh, try to create some events where entrepreneurs actually learn some new things and they, get, uh, they can ask questions to experienced entrepreneurs and investors. So I, we started this nonprofit called Entrepreneurs Roundtable in New York City. And every month we had free events for entrepreneurs and we invited very experienced and also, you know, in the startup world, famous uh, VCs and angel investors. Most of these names, like my friends who are not entrepreneurs, they don't know about Fred Wilson, Howard Morgan, and like, Randy Commissar from you know, Klein and Perkins, very famous people. They, are very, they have a lot of experience. They're very successful. So they would come to our event, and every month we would pick five startups out of 50 or 60 applications. And these five startups get to do something very unique, which is pitch to this investor in five minutes, and the audience of 200 people would watch this pitch. 
So this happened by accident, actually. One of the VCs just impromptu said, why don't one of you guys pitch to me and I will respond to you so you can learn what not to say or what to say. So our events became very popular and many people kind of learned how to pitch to an investor and what components should be in the presentation through our meetings. And with this, you know, we expanded our events into Turkey, into Istanbul and Ankara, and we have uh, people from my alma mater, Bilkent University, who's helping us in Turkey. And also we started having these events in Japan. And also uh, this year we started in Philadelphia. And we are looking into Brazil and India and possibly uh, Abu Dhabi and possibly DC as our next steps. So the reason we are having these global events all over the place, these are free events, is we want to build the local networks and eventually we want to combine these local networks. So if there's a very promising company in Turkey, we can co connect them with investors from New York or vice versa. So Entrepreneurs Roundtable have been running for four years. We had around 200 companies that pitched at our events. We had more than 50 events. More than 1,000 companies applied to pitch. And we had over 60 uh, venture capitalists and angel investors come and speak at our events. And last year, summer, those investors started asking us, you guys are too informal. You are too unprofessional. You know, you just do these events and then you help some random people randomly. They said, why don't you do something more structured? And we started looking into this with my partners and we realized that around 40% of companies who came to pitch at the round table, they were getting funding eventually in up to like one month to eight months. So we realized that we had really, really high quality deal flow. So we started talking to all the the people we know in New York, Boston, California, and we started asking them, like, how would you envision an accelerator? What would be the, the best components? And obviously, we looked at other very successful programs like Y Combinator and Techstars and Dreamit and Launchbox in North Carolina. And I also interviewed face-to-face -face 10 startups that came out of these programs. Because since I'm an entrepreneur, I looked at everything from the point, from point of view of the entrepreneur saying, what would I want if I went into an incubation accelerator program? And we found out very, very uh, typical good things and typical bad things. The, the, the most obvious bad thing was um, one very experienced entrepreneur or investor coming to this incubator and lecturing like 40 people at a time. So generic advice can only be, you know, preserve your cash flow or work hard. So we decided we're not gonna have any of this. And slowly we started building our mentor network. And we came up with around 180 very experienced, really amazing mentors. These are venture capitalists, angel investors, serial entrepreneurs, who had multiple exits, and now they are sitting at home, and their wife is telling them, why don't you go outside and do something, and they are bored, they don't know what to do. <laughs> so when we asked them, they jumped on this, they're like, great, so my summer, I'll do something. So it's a uh, three-month program, and yesterday we announced our 10 companies. Uh, we had around 500 applications from all over the world, actually, we are very proud from everywhere from Africa, South America, Europe, India, China, Taiwan. And uh, we interviewed around 100 companies. So during these three months, we are going to give these 10 companies office space in Times Square. Uh, we are actually a little worried about the tourists. You know, there's too much crowds and a lot of stuff, a lot of, you know, noise happening in Times Square. But um, during those three months, these 10 startups will get $25,000 and also free legal services, free web hosting from Microsoft and Amazon, and they will get even free flights from American Airlines. So each of our startups, they get five 
free domestic flights so they can fly around to California, Texas for conferences or to meet with other investors. And also they get free books from a publisher and uh, they get free phone service from phone.com and so on and so forth. Obviously, like the subject of this panel is uh, financing this early stage. How can we finance this? And yesterday when we were talking with this group, we, we realized that, you know, this is very different from running like a 20 to 100 million dollar venture capital fund because they have like 2% expenses and 20% carry model, which doesn't really work. I mean, Osama's, uh, you know, a small fund cannot pay for Osama. And we have to find a solution for this. We have to come up with a new structure so that there are more um, funds like, you know, Oasis 500 in Jordan. And we are also planning to expand into other countries as we you know, establish our structure. <coughs> but the main point is um, where I'm from in Turkey, um, there are great entrepreneurs with very good ideas. But if you do not enable them, if you don't uh, give them good examples of success, these people will go work at banks or they will come up with bad ideas. They will copy Groupon. There are like 25 Groupons in Turkey. So they will come up with the 26th Groupon. So we want to stop that. And I think this is a great venue for, you know, for the solution. And I want to thank Infodev, World Bank, and IFC for enabling this. Thank you. Thank you, Murat. Now we'll, we'll, we'll shift to geography again, moving over to India. Close by. But still close. Hmm? But still close. Still close, like I say. Well, especially with the pipes these days. Good fiber optics don't even need to travel. I was very impressed with how you're, you're doing it in terms of trying to attract entrepreneurs from, from, from all over and creating the networks between the entrepreneurs because that's so often the experiences they have how they can leverage off of one another because people don't realize it and we see it in our own portfolio companies how much they appreciate when we talk about what's happened in South Africa and how those lessons can apply to India or China or Brazil. Um, as I say, our next speaker is Raul Padwatan. He's Managing Director and Vice Chairman of India Company Ventures. India Co. is an investment and financial services firm listed on the Bombay Stock Exchange. It provides growth capital, strategic direction, and hands-on operational and financial expertise to fast-growing companies. India Co. invests in proprietary capital, manages private equity funds, and also private equity placement and ma merger and acquisition advisory services. Thanks, Kent. And Thank, thank you, World Bank, uh, Valerie, and the rest of the InfoDev team for putting up this great panel. I mean, if there's uh, something that I've, uh, I was actually looking forward to was meeting the rest of the team here, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, going back, you know, when we went, you know, uh, to India Co's first beginnings, um, our intent was always to do, you know, early stage incubation. And we started off pretty much as a you know, hands-on uh, accelerator, incubator, because we used to run boot camps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the biggest problems we, 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 we faced way back when we started um, you know, was, uh, OK, you guys are doing an incubator. OK, how many eggs have you, you did, do you guys hatch? How many uh, chickens do you hatch every, every month? So those are the kind of questions you're getting back, you know, and this is India, you know, where, uh, where, where uh, capital is supposed to be available for early stage companies. So that's, that's the background we started at. And in 2003, we were very fortunate to receive support from the World Bank, uh, InfoDev. Uh, we were one of the first uh, uh, grantees of the incubation program that we received uh, some uh, excellent support from them. Um, even, even at that time, I think it was a little, uh, we were a little ahead of our time, irrespective. And, it, and, and for, for InfoDev to come and support us at that point of time 
was extremely useful uh, in terms of putting our credibility and track record in play. So we used that. <clears throat> so what we did was we did something very interesting. We used that credibility and track record and said, how can we actually work with startups? How can we actually work with early stage companies uh, using credibility and track record of what we've, what we've received and be able to raise capital at the same time? So we started, started exploring what we termed as a, a dual investment model. And uh, Indeco was one of the first guys to uh, you know, support several companies. And we did, we did make uh, you know, significantly uh, several investments. Uh, we're also extremely lucky that several of them uh, did extremely well for us. We got listed. We got, we got, um, we got an excellent return for what, whatever we did. So we used that, and we said, OK. We're going to create a fund. It's going to be a private equity fund because uh, there wasn't uh, capital available for early stage. But you know, our intent was always to support early stage companies. So we said, hey, what we'll do is we will invest two to five million dollars in a stable, growing company so it's growth capital. But what we will do is we will make synergistic acquisitions of smaller uh, vehicles or smaller companies that can align either to technology, team, product, market, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with the large entity. So it is a it is a it is a bypass, uh, you know, for us uh, to raise a significantly larger amount of capital because that's what everyone wants. Uh, you know, we have two funds in play right now, and uh, you know we're still getting push from our uh, from our partners saying that look go for a 250 million fund or raise 500 million dollars don't raise 100 million dollars so these are you know typical you know pressures because uh, you know most of these institutions have their own pressures in terms of what they can deploy and their internal costs determine how much they can deploy in these companies or these funds so having said that it you know we we went through an interesting transition of uh, early stage and we're, we're still focused uh, our strategy still focuses extremely um, uh, minutely on what we term as technology focus, which not very many private equity funds actually have. So we still focus on IPR. We, we are very extremely focused on the team. Uh, we like markets. We like significant markets to grow. So we do focus on markets that are outside India, typically. Um, but you know, we've also realized that India is a big market as well. So we tend to bring companies. So we've done acquisitions outside India. So startups and early stage companies uh, outside India, we've made acquisitions for our anchor investments, thereby bringing technology, uh, excellent teams, and products and scale to the Indian market. Um, the last investment we did was um, we made about, uh, I think we invested about 19 odd million dollars. Uh, but we made 16 small acquisitions in that large vehicle, uh, through which we were able to consolidate you know, we, we acquired a very small design firm. It was a 10-people design firm, early stage startup. Uh, we acquired a, a, a prototyping company out of Italy, um, you know, for, for, this, for this large vehicle. And, uh, you know, we were able to resurrect the whole storyboard running what we term as our early stage mixed strategy with private equity. Um, but there is capital, and we're, we're seeing, you know, we, we, we also realized very quickly that for us to be able to create you know, access points like Osama and what um, you know, Murath is doing in New York, uh, we, we have actually taken a small, we've taken an, a significant equity stake in an accelerator in India. And the intent being very simple, we'll run, through the, run our companies through an accelerator program. And whatever comes out of there, whatever spills out, and whatever is interesting for us, if it synergistically fits in any of our vehicles, we will bring them into our vehicle. And that's the, you know, we realize that there is capital deficiency in terms of early stage. We understand that. But, you know, this is an interesting play in which, by which we're trying to, you know, provide capital to the early stage uh, companies. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. From our experience in IFC, if you look at the, the two countries with the most funding available, it's clearly India and China. 
That being said, I, there's, I think there's still the challenge, and maybe we can explore a little further, the early, early stage investments. And, and as uh, you were saying yesterday, you, you said there's close to like 400 funds, 400, 400 yeah. funds right now in India. Tens, yeah. But really, what, five to seven, you were guessing? That was five was to seven, yeah, who invest sub million dollars. So it's, it's, uh, that, it's I mean, still I'm not even going to the numbers that Osama and Alessandro would like, you know, uh, sub $100,000. Uh, there aren't any funds to do that. So we recognize even where the, the, there's the money, there's still the gap. Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, our, our, our final participant, Folabi Hassan of Adlevo Capital. For, for purposes of full disclosure, Adlevo Capital is an I, uh, a company, a fund uh, management company. We, IFC invested in their first fund last year. Uh, it, although based out of Nigeria, it's a Mauritius-based legally private equity fund. Uh, it targets investments into technology-enabled infrastructure and service companies in sub-Sahara Africa with an emphasis on Nigeria and South Africa. Thank Olabi. you very much, Gens. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, it's a great privilege and a pleasure to be at this uh, forum. I must say that we very nearly weren't here, so thanks especially to Altec for following up and making sure that we, we got here. And the reason for our not sort of, first of all, jumping at the opportunity was we, we got this um, information about sub-million dollar investments and so on. And our fund, as uh, Kent has said, is really focused on growth capital. You know, we're looking at expansion stage businesses in sub-Saharan Africa. So initially, it wasn't really something that was in our focus. But then I guess Altec uh, spoke to my partner and subsequently to me, and, and we sort of realized that the quality of people that would be here, the kind of companies we're going to meet, uh, the discussion would uh, benefit us immensely. And perhaps we could bring a little bit of a perspective from Africa, this big uh, continent, Africa, uh, to the discussion. At Limbo Capital is a first-time fund, a first-time team, and we had a very interesting experience actually raising the fund um, because, first of all, we don't, as partners, three partners, we don't really have a financial background. Um, we all come from operational backgrounds or consulting, um, managing, or entrepreneurs. And uh, our thinking was that there wasn't enough money uh, in the environment to support companies that had good ideas and wanted to grow. Uh, we looked at the landscape, and we found that, especially for technology, there were no funds, absolutely no funds, in Africa that were focused on expansion stage growth um, and Pan-African. In fact, we found only one fund based in South Africa that had a focus on technology-enabled uh, businesses. Now, this is kind of strange in, a, in the 21st century, the digital world and... Web 2.0 and everything that's going on, social media. I mean, it's kind of weird to have no fund really looking at technology-enabled businesses, but that's what we found. Um, when we looked de deeper into the, into the issues, we found that there were lots of companies that were active, small companies active, trying to do things in that space, but we, um, we saw that there weren't any large companies for them to sort of plug into. So there's, there's another gap there in terms of the, uh, the landscape of businesses where when you have a small company that's, that's doing something, who is this company selling to as a big company? Who are they plugged into? Where's the value chain for growth? And this only existed to, to some extent in uh, South, South Africa. The rest of the continent was really sort of empty. So our, our, our target was really to say, we wanted to find the companies that were already um, at some stage selling things, having some revenue, but needed to expand across Africa. So it's expansion not just within your market, but also connecting to the markets that are the hubs, which is why we're in Lagos and Johannesburg as offices, even though we're a Mauritius fund. And we really work to get regional companies to look at the large markets of South Africa, large markets of Nigeria, and say, what can we develop in Ghana, for example, 
where the market in reality would be Nigeria. And just to say what is uh, working, um, we are finding that this overall uh, thesis is beginning to work. We see many, many companies in Ghana, which are small companies, um, five people, maybe up to 10, working together. But the, the, the technologies they're working on, the, the systems they're working on developing, would be very useful in Nigeria. Now they have a big issue trying to cross the barriers, and, and there are significant barriers, um, even though we have the continent as being one large continent. In actual fact, there are very big differences between business in East Africa, in West Africa, in South Africa, uh, you know, the whole place, there's language barriers, there's uh, regulatory barriers, and so on. So having a fund where the partners are operational hands-on people who understand um, some aspects of the technology you're speaking about, who are, who've also been entrepreneurs in the past, and who can help you to move your idea and your technology from uh, one region in Africa to another, I think has been a very big positive for us and has brought lots of deal flow to, to the fund so far. Listening to the other panelists this morning, um, I've been barraged by ideas, all sorts of things coming to the fore. Um, Jordan, Argentina, uh, New York, and also India. And one of the things that I've, uh, I've realized is that we have a big deficit in Africa in terms of where we're starting from. You know, the conditions precedent, what we, what we ought to have to start with in many parts is not there. And one of the big things that I think is a really a problem is that people, you know, want to go to some parts and don't want to go to some parts. So I've often hosted friends and uh, colleagues from East Africa and asked them why there are Google, Nokia, and all these big companies um, in Kenya, and why are they not in Ghana or Nigeria? And uh, the, the, the answer that my, my partner gives tongue in cheek is that they have better safaris in Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that um, people don't know. And there's, there's, a, there's a very high, uh, let's say, factor of uh, just the unknown. The news that we get from, from Nigeria, and especially from Nigeria, is not usually good news. Uh, most people don't visit but they watch CNN and then they make their decisions and say, well, why take the risk when I can actually you know, be in Africa via Kenya? But I think one of the big things that we could take away from here is that actually we need to get more people to come by. We need to get more people to come and see the energy. We need to have more exchanges uh, within the continent of Africa and outside the continent of Africa to other parts of the world. I've been um, extremely impressed by the number of entrepreneurs from Africa that are here, and I have to thank the InfoDev team for finding these guys. Um, I've been a bit, uh, you know, actually I've looked around and I didn't see a company from Nigeria, which is really strange. Um, for a country of 150 million people, largest country, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think we'll have to do something about that. Malik, I think, is here uh, from one of the incubators in Nigeria. He's here, so we'll have to do something about that for your next, for your next event and make sure we have a number of companies in the, in the team. But I just want to end up by saying, giving a little uh, case study of a company that we've been working with for about three, three years now, uh, just to illustrate some of the issues. This company has come up with a very innovative uh, solution to uh, draw counterfeiting problem. And for those who might be aware, uh, about 30%, maybe globally, maybe 10% of drugs are counterfeit. And in Africa, that probably is about 30%. So the chances of uh, being killed by the drug you think will heal you, very, very high. Uh, I think about 700,000 people die annually from uh, buying drugs that actually have either the wrong uh, components in them or no component at all. Uh, this gentleman has come up with a very interesting solution. That's a mobile-based technology, won lots of prizes, and we'll be working with this company for a while, trying to get them uh, to a stage where we can invest in them. But I've been speaking to a number of people who know this company, and the real issue here is um, that we are unable 
to get the promoters to put in a proper structure. For one reason or the other, they, I think there are two things. First, the organizational structure is not there, corporate governance is not there. They have great ideas, but everything is really close to their chest. Now, this comes to a problem of trust in the system, building up the proper uh, regulation um, protections for intellectual property, ensuring that people can fail and still have another chance. So there are issues that go well beyond whether there's money or there's no money, how much money you have or you don't have, to ensuring that entrepreneurs feel comfortable right, sharing at events like the ones that uh, Murat hosts, right, at the kind of things that Usama is doing, and to make sure that there are systems in place to ensure that these entrepreneurs are able to build up sufficient uh, structures organizationally and in terms of governance for them to feel comfortable even taking the money from an entrepreneur, uh, from a venture capital firm or a private equity firm. Um, for Adlevo, we think that this is a problem that we need to sit down with our uh, investors, uh, the IFC and others, and to really see what we can do, maybe borrowing from what India Co is doing, to say, well, perhaps we need to look at uh, dedicating some part of the funds we have under management to smaller companies. And this could be much less than uh, even $15,000. I like the number 15,000. The number in my head is about 5,000, actually. You know, if you, if you, that's about a million naira in Nigeria, something like that. So if you have a million naira in Nigeria, 5,000, 7,000 dollars, you should be able to get started, even if it's a high cost environment. So I think I'll stop here. Uh, what I'm trying to say in a nutshell is that um, the, the problems I think are qualitatively different uh, in some parts of Africa, I'm impressed by Kenya. Uh, it's a very different ecosystem, and I have some ideas about why that is different. Uh, I think Ghana is also different, but if you look at where the real growth and, and action will be, uh, and that's not because I'm a Nigerian, but I mean, you know, it's got to be that Nigeria has to get it right for Africa to also to grow. And for that to happen, there are qualitative issues that we all need to deal with um, you know, beyond the money problem. I think there are lots of ideas here to help us with that. Thank you. Thank you, Falabi. Uh, I always remember the quote of John Templeton, who, who, whose statement was, the best time to invest is the moment of maximum pessimism. <laughs> we have in IFC sort of the Africa derivative in terms of you know, the best time to invest are the, are the countries in the worst situation because you can get great opportunities. And if you look at our equity returns as a continent-wide, they're probably highest in Africa than, than, than anywhere uh, in, in, in the world. So, you know, yes, it's a difficult place to invest, but because it's difficult, there are good opportunities. Uh, with that, uh, we would like to now take about, I guess, 15, 20 minutes for an open discussion, questions to our panel. So I'd be asking if there's questions from the audience. And if so, um, please state your name um, beforehand. Just before the, 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 the I, I already see a few hands before that. I would like to just follow up, especially with Usama and, 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 and Murat, for a question I had. Because as we've seen, you know, it's not a question of just money. It's a question of, of, of guidance, mentorship other seed investors. So, so I put it to you two. What would you recommend, or how have you gone about, one, finding the mentors, mentors, and two, the, the angel investors? Um, so speaking, uh, speaking for the Oasis 500 experience, um, you know, I, I think it's easy. I, I hear this term a lot. There's you know, it's not just about funding. But the unfortunate part is when people say that term, they forget about, well, if you don't have the funding, you don't have anything. <laughs> so um, it is true that it's not just about the funding. But let's not forget that it's not easy. Uh, say, say what I'm trying to do. Uh, it's not easy to convince investors to invest in early stage. Why? Because there are no successful early stage funds out there to date. I think Y Combinator 
and tech stars have begun setting some of the examples. I think what I've uh, witnessed, at least in terms of the growth of the valuations of our companies, um, the examples are, are <coughs> starting, but it's not enough. So what does that mean? That means we need help. We need help um, to make sure that you know, we, we get investments from entities, whether it's IFC or others, who actually lend credibility, give assurance to investors that this is, hey, wait a second, this is not entirely crazy. Um, I mean, I'll quote, I'll quote a couple of statistics. Um, y Combinator. In a very recent interview, I think about a week ago, by Paul Graham, who is sort of the only mentor in Y Combinator, um, the total uh, worth of the portfolio companies of Y Combinator now is $3 billion. Do you know how much was invested in those companies? $5 million, right? $5 million to, four, to $3 billion in four years or so. Uh, Techstars, which actually uses a mentor network, has a very nice statistic. Half the companies they invest in don't make it, but of the other half, 30% will have an exit at $10 million or above within two years, right? The other 20% go on and, and who knows what, what happens to them. But, but we need a lot more of these stories. So, you know, with Oasis 500, I can, I can go around six months ago, I had nothing to say. Now I can say, well, we're witnessing 3x to 7x growth in valuations in, in uh, 100 days, in three months. I mean, those are interesting returns to investors. Uh, we need to sort of establish that and get investors comfortable uh, to, to, move, uh, to move to that. The other part of why I think early stage funds have not worked is what I started with in my first comment. Training is very expensive. The way I got around that as, as um, you know, my entrepreneurial solution to that is we set up a non-for-profit company which actually goes out and begs for money from telcos, from banks, from other uh, uh, institutions to say, please help us fund this training course that we give free. Now, one of the things I learned from doing this is what I thought was the greatest weakness in the Oasis 500 story, which is the fact that the training is very expensive, turned out to be our greatest strength. Why? Because during that training, I can do the kind of due diligence on not just the idea, but more importantly, on the individuals and their commitment and you know, their, their resilience and all that that no VC, no venture capitalist can ever do. They just simply cannot afford to do it. And what I also learned is this hands-on 100 days gives me a way to evaluate these companies and to know them more than any VC could ever know their portfolio companies. So by the time they finish the 100 days, if I say, you know, this company is going to make it, I'm saying it with more knowledge than anybody else. But these things, you know, running the angel network, running the mentor network to support it, running the training, it's very expensive. That's another area where we need help. Uh, without it, I, don't, I, I think the economics are simple. You cannot have sustainable uh, early stage investment funds without that ability to attract the sponsorship and to attract uh, uh, the, the supplemental funding to, to get started. Now, I believe, and I'll end on, on a positive note, that once we have these stories in place, once the, the process gets started, you'll actually grow business models for these things, right? Techstars today actually has a real business model. I think Murat is onto something, and he's going to have a real business model. But these guys operate in the United States. What we need is your help to show the developing world that, you know what, let's prime the pump here, 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 you know, India, other places, uh, Argentina, hopefully, where, you know, there's a maximum. I, I learned last night it's, it's the place with the highest promise and the least achievement <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Where, you know, let, let's get the achievements there, right? Um, except in soccer. Except in soccer, yeah. <laughs> Football. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, one thing that we've been doing, which is uh, expanding our free monthly events to build our local networks all over the world, we learned a lot. For example, um, in Turkey, I already knew lots of people, so building our network and reaching all the local angel investors was pretty easy. In Tokyo, we had a lot of problems uh, because people are not under 
couple networks where you can reach out and get to easily. So for example, um, now like I'm thinking about starting ER in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, starting ER in Nigeria. And uh, so what we would do is we would just be present. We would have a couple of meetings and start, you know, promoting our events to entrepreneur networks, the ones that we can find. And what we've seen in Tokyo is uh, when you do that, the right people come and find you. They sign up on your mailing list. They reach out to you and they say, I want to be a speaker at your event. And um, this has been like very successful for us. So right now for ERA this summer, we are getting inbound mentorship. People who want to be mentors, they are writing us. They are saying, I, I'm a great person. I'm, I'm the best person in the world. I want to be a mentor. So I think like what InfoDev is doing is great also. They have, you have 350 incubators all over the world. Uh, I think we can, we can combine these networks. And once we do that, uh, all these great companies, like a startup from um, Osama's Oasis 500, you know, we, we can get them funding from another country. Or like we can take this startup and do their, you know, marketing in Europe or in the US. So I think the answer is just being present and being consistent and also bringing value to anyone who comes to one of our meetings. So takeaway is very important for us. So you have to learn something in each of our meetings or otherwise, you know, you end up like me standing in a bar with a beer bottle and then just going home. So. Okay, questions from the field. Start with that gentleman there. Is there a mic getting to him? Good morning. I'm Balachandran from uh, India. Uh, let me compliment the panelists for the comprehensive discussion. It was uh, really enlightening. Um, my observation is like uh, InfoDev's uh, first uh, global forum was in India in uh, 2004. Uh, the forum passed on a resolution stating that governments should establish a seed fund in the incubators to assist startup companies. And this was proactively followed up by the government of India. Now at least about 15 uh, business incubators in India have their seed fund grant available from the government. Apart from that, there are other windows for innovation grant and early stage business building grant. And picking the cue from uh, the panelists that 5%, less than 5% of the funds are available from the venture capitalists uh, for a less than a million dollar requirement. I think I'm going to be a little provocative. Uh, there is a mismatch between what is actually needed in the ground in the developing economies uh, for the startup companies. It's not VC money. To a greater extent, it is CC money, the customer capital, if it can be made available through the business model or early stage seed funding mechanisms like this and uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it to the panel for additional points if any. This is my observation. Thank you. Maybe we could take a couple more questions before having the, the, the panel respond. Gentlemen. Um, but you know the, the, the topic is technology financing and the comments were made about the valley of death and desert and then oasis and then the comments like $15,000 go a long way because you have to spend $15,000 first and then you go on. I think all of those statements are fairly appropriate when you are, when you are focused on IT solutions. So if you're creating a social, if you have a social networking idea, it really works if you get $15,000, you start up, you get a network of 10,000 people, you can get $20,000, you get a network of 100,000 people. By the time you have a network of million users, you pretty much can go and get financing. So that all works. But if we move to fields other than IT, like chemical engineering, so suppose I have an idea 
where I have come up with a catalyst for Fisher trough process to go from syngas to biodiesel. Uh, by the way, I'm from Pakistan, National University of Science and Technology, and uh, going from the Brazilian experience explained on Monday morning, which I really appreciated, we would like very much to um, support innovation and entrepreneurship at grassroots level connected to national scale problems. And this is one of the problems. Now, when you are solving this problem, like um, a catalyst for a very significant chemical process needed for national growth, then the ideas of $15,000 really don't take you anywhere. Just to go from a lab scale model that gives you a milliliter or a liter of uh, biodiesel per day to a reactor that gives you maybe 100 gallons a day, which industry is going to laugh at, needs a million dollars. If you are successful at that, then to take it to a chemical company that's willing to test it out, you probably need another 15, 20 million dollars. So that sort of technology is, it seems like, not being addressed at this forum, or is, and does any one of the uh, panelists have any experience in that area? Thank you. Okay. Well, why don't okay. we go, go ahead, ahead and yeah. take one more question, and then we'll, well, we'll let me, to while, while they're getting a question, let me answer it, because I think, I think it's important, it, it's, you know, your, your question, your question is correct. I'm not going to comment about, uh, you know, heavy industry and, and uh, chemical processing and all of that, but I will comment about an area that I know. This, uh, this myth that you can start a successful, you can get a million users to your site with, you know, $15,000 investment is completely untrue. It is extremely, extremely expensive to get a lot of users to use your website. So I don't think that the capital needs you know, of, of IT startups are necessarily that much, and, and large ones, ones with, with scale, are that much lower than, than uh, uh, you know, the needs of, of industrial companies and so forth. I know this sounds controversial. I'll tell you, Google, do you know how, many, how much they spent before they actually turned profitable? You know, they, ha they spent $60 million before they had a business model. Facebook is in the billions before they turned profitable. Uh, LinkedIn, well over a billion dollars spent before they actually, and they has, they're not profitable yet, right? Now, uh, here's the point. The point I'm trying to make, at least my experience, is fine, you need 10 million, you need, you need 100 million, great. You're going to start somewhere, and you're going to do something for those first three months. And by the way, that $15,000 is not, not intended to take you for years or forever. That's only intended to take you 100 days or less, and only intended to enable you to attract capital. I think what those companies that I mentioned, the successful ones, what they did is manage to attract capital, lots of capital, to become uh, big and scalable. Rahul, I know you had a comment. Yeah. You know, just to add to, you know, some, I think it's, it's absolutely right that obviously, you know, the first 100 days you don't need to spend, you know, a couple of million dollars on, right. on validating a business plan. I think it's, it's extremely... Uh, you know, $15,000 for three months to get your business plan, your pitch, and your act together as far as a presentation and, a bus and, a, and an executive summary is concerned, I think that's more than adequate money. I agree with your other point, and that's where, you know, we found a lot of problems, uh, especially where, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, have gone through the initial three months, you have a pitch document ready, you have an investor presentation ready, but what you don't have is a million-dollar investment ready for a potential chemical plant like what you said. So what we, so what we did was exactly the buy, the, the buy lane that we always take. Very simply, we would hook you up with someone within our portfolio group that has capability to manufacture what you say. Now, if you're a lab scale product, you'll be extremely scared to take that to the, to the large manufacturing entity because you're not going to be able to show and demonstrate scale. So obviously that takes two things into, into account. First, your product validation, which means scalability of a product, immediately comes into play. Which means if you're not able to take lab scale to market scale, obviously your product is not worth investing a million dollars in. That's one. Number two, if your product actually has the scale to go from lab scale to manufacturing scale, then obviously you deserve the million dollars. 
and you'll get that through the manufacturing company. So that's the byway. But in my experience, most of the research labs, I'm, I'm not speaking very generically, I'm speaking specifically for India and the regions around India. Uh, I know the US is extremely well developed in terms of technology transfer, because the models in terms of transferring technology, which are at a particular stage, are extremely easy to replicate in a large manufacturing setup. That is not the case in most developing countries. Our budgets in developing countries are extremely small. The understanding, the education base of most of our scientists is extremely low in, in several other research areas. The, in several other cases, it's reasonably high. But having said that, we don't have the models in place. I mean, when, if, if, you, if you seriously think that the technology that you have deserves a million dollars, I'd be very happy to speak to you and put you in touch with the manufacturing base. But if it doesn't make sense, you know, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be uh, losing out on that opportunity. So. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, clearly a hot topic. I, I know Lissandra wanted to make a quick comment, and then I, I, I know there's still a lot of questions out here. So, Lissandra? Uh, yes. It, hello. Yes, in my experience, for projects coming from engineering uh, university, type of uh, uh, history. The issue is that when I ask the, the promoter of Roger, well, tell me what's the market size opportunity for this? Who are the competitors on a global scale for what you are trying to do? The answer in general is not there because in the DNA of the team is not the market, the commercial, the opportunity driven person. So if I have to make any comment is how do we input very early in all these engineering projects the marketing, the commercial, the, the, val the, te the value of the technology from a market perspective to make an investment proposal uh, attractive. And, and that's my, my feeling in general with the engineering university driven. And, and not to dismiss the challenge, not to dismiss the challenge, we do need help in the follow on funding. I mean, and I've been accused by many people in Jordan of, you know, what are you, you're playing with people's lives, what are you doing, you're raising their hopes, and then they're not going to get follow-on funding, and they will just fall off. Uh, it is needed, right? You do need to set up a system. But I do think that the first thing you need to do is take whatever it is, the product, the idea, develop the business plan around it, make sure you have a team, make sure you have an argument that stands muster with investors, and then you're ready for that. So to me, you know, if we can, and this would be a proposal to IFC, for example, you know, help us create a funding source for follow-on funding for companies that actually have, you know, checked the boxes on all the requirements to sort of go to market. Okay, thank you. Um, questions, let's see, we got one, two. Okay, right, let's right try this there, gentleman right here, here front. Oh, okay, thank you. I need uh, that help. Actually, I have a, a series of comments, not, not, not a question. Um, you, please, please introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, Amar Mardenbe with uh, one of the uh, founders of Siraj Capital and now uh, founder of uh, Merchant Edge, uh, which is a, an accelerator. Um, one of the topics that uh, has been bantied around is how can InfoDev, how can the IFC, how can the World Bank help facilitate, seed, provide funding, encourage, uh, nurture, what have you, the uh, private equity or the, the entrepreneurs throughout the world. And while it's going to take a little bit of time to for them to figure out the proper channel, the proper venue, the proper mechanism to do that, one of the things I wanted to throw out and suggest is, you know, I'm speaking about the MENA region, okay? And one of the biggest problems we have with entrepreneurs is failure is taboo. Lissandro's definition of success is fail, 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 and eventually you'll get there, okay? So maybe some sort of a program, uh, uh, an awareness program that, you know what? If you don't fail, you're not going to make it. It's okay to try once, twice, three times, and then uh, uh, eventually you'll make it. What, what Usama's doing with Oasis 500 is, you know, setting the trend towards that. What's, what's uh, uh, happening there, though, is 
uh, he's being accused that he's playing with people's lives. Well, if there's an awareness campaign that's, that's uh, supported by InfoDev, the World Bank, the IFC, that's, you know, te teaches people, teaches entrepreneurs that it's okay if you fail the first time or the second time or the third time, because if you don't fail, you never get there. Very important point. Um, you have a mic there, yes. Uh, and I think if you can just keep an eye on, I'll just let you f identify the people for the follow-up question. Uh, thank you for your, your comments, uh, great, um, uh, great insights. I'm Zia Imran, I'm from Pakistan Software Export Board. Um, we are also one of the recipients of M Labs uh, grant from InfoDev. Um, we sort of run a small micro incubator, if you will, um, somewhat along the lines of what Osama mentioned. And the question to Osama, you, is that um, one of the things that I'm concerned with uh, is that where do these companies go? What's the exit? Uh, at least in Pakistan, we have a public market, but there's no appetite for at least technology-based companies to go and have an exit. And at the end of the day, the investors need to get paid their money. Um, so in your case, uh, probably you have a similar challenge. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Yeah, great, uh, great question. The uh, you know, we don't, we don't rely on, on uh, public markets in, in the MENA region, at least, uh, just because the, the process is, is, uh, is too complicated. Uh, however, what I do think is once, once you set up a tradition of these exits, and they, and they will start. I mean, an, an ecosystem, you know, everybody talks about ecosystem, and they forget that in an ecosystem, you know, at, at the lowest levels, you know, you have these li little, little tiny fish who eat little tiny things, right? Uh, and that, that's how the whole thing starts. Um, you need to have a lot of these low-level, you know, frequent exits, probably low value, right? But huge number in order to set the grassroots and the base. I think eventually it will make it into public markets and into, you know, all sorts of uh, things like that. But I think in the, in the MENA region... Uh, the, the private equity markets in terms of, you know, companies taking out other companies or private equity funds taking out companies um, is there. Uh, I think one of the reasons I was encouraged to do Oasis 500 is, is I saw a region where, you know, I, I, I called it financial constipation. Lots of capital <laughs> and nobody, no deals to deploy it in, right? <laughs> And, and the reason for that, it's actually a, a psychological problem, right? The guys with lots of capital are very conservative, and they just can't get themselves to step up and say, you know what, I'll fund you. It's okay. You know, the, the logic of 10 failures and one success doesn't, you know, doesn't hit, hit them right, even though that one success is going to make up for 100 failures. That's one. The other part is the guys who make it across the desert, where there is no funding, they get so hardened that they don't want to ever take capital for equity. So by the time they, they become interesting to the private equity guys, they basically don't want to talk to them, right? Hey, you mean you want a ch chunk of my company after I've been through all this stuff? Forget it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of what we're trying to do is, is you know, get rid of this constipation. <laughs> Sorry for the bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Thank you, moderator. My name is Lon Lon from Ghana. Um, thank you, panelists. Uh, it seems that we are leaving the financial sector, the commercial banks, out of the picture. Uh, they could also help. Uh, currently in Africa, uh, especially in my market, Ghana, the SME's main challenge is that the sector is too informal and uh, that uh, the financial sector actually tag the SME sector a high risk sector. And so they are, they, you know, want, uh, they are unable to release cash to them without collateral, uh, without, uh, uh, you know, uh, without, uh, uh, without insisting that they provide very, very, you know, you know strong collateral. And uh, I was actually going to ask the panelists if we could consider, uh, you know, developing models that will erase or minimize the risk components on the sector, the SME sector, which will then uh, call, you know, propel the financial sector to come in and also with uh, a lower acceptable lending rate. History has actually proved that Ghanaian SMEs in the past, they take uh, uh, funding from the 
commercial sector. And because interest rate is up to 37, 45%, they are unable to pay both the principal and the interest, and then they tend to run away from the banks. And their business dies, and they have bad reputation with the bank. So I was looking at, uh, you know, venture capitalists, wonderful. Uh, IFC, uh, World Bank, Info, they're coming on board, wonderful. But it seems we are leaving the financial sector, the commercial banks uh, off the way. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it's... It's a good point. One, one comment I'll make there. Um, something that the IFC and, 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 and maybe World Bank, but IFC can probably help a lot with, is sort of start the system. If you go to a mature, a mature ecosystem for investments in the United States, the highest risk venture capital money, the highest risk venture capital money do you know where it comes from? The biggest VC firms and the most aggressive VC firms for early stage on, on Sand Hill Road derive most of their funds from university endowments, from pension funds, and from very, very big institutions like, like banks who are you know, allocating some of their, for diversification uh, purposes, the money there. So it's the most conservative money in the world that's going into the most aggressive investments. And that's because they have proven, right, over time, that the returns are very high and, and you know, worth it. So to me today, you know, I might sit here and tell you, I'm seeing 3x to 7x growth in three months, for God's sake. But it's going to need, you know, 100, 1,000 of these examples before, you know, people understand it when you don't have the ecosystem. So I think that's a great place where, where uh, you know, IFC or World Bank could play a role in sort of enabling, priming that pump. Maybe, uh, Alavi, do you have anything from, from, from your perspective on this? As you thank you very much, Kent. Yes, I, um, thank you, Lolo, for the question and the comments concerning bank financing. But I, I think we have to start from what you said. You said the banks consider SMEs as high risk um, and informal. I think that's very, very pertinent because many, many uh, small and medium scale companies don't take the time to structure themselves for the market they're approaching. And this is not about collateral. This is about showing that you have proper structures for management, you understand your, your business thoroughly, you've done a risk analysis, right, and you're, you're really ready to take on corporate governance that shows that you will manage this, the, the funds you get to the best ability. Very often Often, the companies are very keen to get the money, and they don't do the proper math, okay? So they think they can take a loan at 45%. Well, you know, anyone can really tell you that, you know, all you need is for one deal to fall through, and then you're in trouble, okay? And so you think, well, I'm going to get this order, and therefore I'm going to be able to pay off the loan and all. If it doesn't happen, well, you're in trouble. And then that really messes up your credit, but it also messes up the credit for the whole sector as well. So there's a whole uh, slew of work that needs to be done, again, to help uh, small companies to match their expectations uh, and their, their pitch to what an investor wants to hear. One of the things I think is very important is also the time between starting up your business and getting to speak to an investor or a bank. And I think Osama is very right. I mean, honestly, if it takes you more than uh, three to six months to get in front of an investor or a, an institutional uh, financier somehow, right? then by the time you actually do get money, you're already battle-hardened, right? You've, you've gone through a lot of stress, and you're, you're really not happy to speak to these guys. So rather than spend a lot of time, you know, just bootstrapping for a long time, I think the, the better idea might be to start with very little money, uh, put together a plan that's very solid, and try and get that financed by someone, and, and just take, take on the additional governance, additional structure, Right? But that will help you go a much longer way. So we do see these issues with the banks, but I think that from our perspective, what we advise the, the, the entrepreneurs we see is uh, get there quicker. Right? You know, spend your first money wisely, put together a plan, put a structure in place, get there quicker. If someone says no to you, well, maybe you ditch that plan and do the next one. But don't stay on this one thing and say, well, I'm going to you know, do or die. No, there, there isn't any do or die enterprise. Just get there with as much structure as you can, and, and then move on. Can I, can I just ask you a question? 
does, does, do African banks recognize uh, equity investment as, uh, as a, you know, because in India we have most banks recognize one as to one. So if I make a hundred dollar investment in a company, typically a bank would be able to provide uh, uh, leverage on the equity investment of, you know, at least 1.5 times of the investment? Uh, actually, I think the answer would be, in general, no. 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 Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the banking sector, again, this is one of the, the, the things about having private equity uh, coming up in, in Africa now. The banking sector is really described as, you know, lend you an umbrella when you don't need it, right? <laughs> and then asking, asking for it when it starts to rain. So they ask for collateral, and if you run into any trouble, they call your collateral, call the loan, and you're really left, left uh, in the lurch. Got it. Um. All right. Um, yeah, just, just very quick on that point. I, th I, th I think that was a very good discussion. I mean, when you're looking at SMEs, you know, distinguishing that between early stage companies, and what you're talking about are SMEs that have cash flow, small businesses, and then the risk return parameters are different. Then I very much agree with Falabi that you have to move them from informal to formal. Then institutions like IFC, the bank and others, have to work with these institutions to get them more comfortable with doing cash flow as opposed to collateralized le lending. Uh, like I say, we're running out of time. We've run over, but we have a couple more questions, so I will now pass it over to you. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Tain Murthy. I manage a uh, rural technology incubator based out of India. Uh, uh, since uh, Rahul mentioned early that uh, we are looking at investment sizes, uh, you know, even less than 100 USDs. We have about 20 companies in our portfolio, and uh, we are looking for about uh, rising funds for five of them. And uh, when the ticket sizes are less than 100 USD, it's hard to make a sale, and uh, the selling, uh, you know, the selling becomes even more difficult. So my question uh, to the panel would be how to make, I mean, what would be the right strategy to, uh, or the cues to consider in order to make this sale more compelling, compelling and for these angel, you know, angel network or the VC network to get interested. Another extended question, if I may have, is, uh, you know, having this business acceleration programs is a great tool uh, for the companies to uh, get their business model right, to get their plan right, and get their uh, act right. Uh, do we have any such business activation programs in India? If so, uh, how do we approach them? Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually not sure whether the government uh, incubators that are funded in India do have a program, but uh, there's a company in, in, in Pune that we've invested in that does uh, do this very similar acceleration program. Um, it's run on our old India Co model, so it's a very focused initiative. And we're very choosy, and I think they're very choosy about who they bring into the program, because I think they train 10 people at a time. Um, as far as the investments are concerned, you know, specifically, it depends on you know where and what you're trying to raise. Whether it's uh, sub hundred hundred thousand dollars, then there are several angel groups all over the country today: uh, Mumbai Angels, Delhi Angels, there's Bangalore Angels, there's Angels in. Uh, Chennai that have just started up that we've also participated in. Uh, all these angels would be the right, you know, specific place for, you know, your innovation or your, your you know, the companies that you have in play uh, to go to. Uh, post that, you know, it depends on, you know, what is your status on those companies, whether you've trained them up enough, whether they've gone through the programs in the right fashion and, you know, what they're able to, you know, generate. Yeah. Angel investments are happening in India. And just, just, I mean, just to draw on a real example fr from the ground, you know, small country like Jordan, no, no history or culture of angel investments. People looking at you funny if you say invest in a technology company that's not even profitable and is just starting. We held an event, six pitches. All of them are getting... Uh, investments from mostly from angels and I agree completely that you need you need that layer of angel investors because those companies will enter that zone that's you know not seed stage but too early for VC to think about the amount too small etc so the angels and what I encourage you is you know I was able to do it in a town that had no angel network uh, but it needed work. It needed preparing the pitches right, you know, making the party interesting enough, that kind of thing. 
uh, to attract people. And we attracted them without asking for any obligation, right? Part of the equation is to say, just show up. Have fun, watch a few pitches, and go home. We don't expect you to fund anyone. They get excited, they'll step up once they get uh, the story. And that's another area where, again, IFC could help is, you know, you know co-invest with angels. Create some fund that says, you know, we will co-invest if, you know, the deal gets so much matching funds, that kind of thing. Okay, we have time for one last quick question and response. Good morning. My name is Ahmed Layali. I'm responsible for ICT incubation in Egypt. Uh, actually, my, uh, my question, I have a question and an invitation. Question for Osama and, for, and uh, Murad is uh, how do you do valuation for your startups, especially Osama, you're saying you're keeping them for 100 days. And, uh, you know, it turns to be from 6x to 7x, which is very difficult to calculate for a startup, actually. And Murad, if you can comment on that, I'll be appreciating this a lot. Our the invitation is uh, for all of you to, to look into companies from startups from Egypt. Actually, we have a couple of companies outside over here presenting in the, 50, in the top 50. And uh, with the good news that Intel had acquired one of the startups in Egypt, full acquisition. And Nokia actually is helping us in that space as well. Thank you. Um, you know, er early stage valuation is, is very tricky. The way we do it, and you know, some might argue we're too generous. Uh, we invest $15,000, and our investment in their time, in the network, in, in the mentoring, and in the uh, incubation of their accounting, HR, legal, uh, PR, etc. We, we value that to be at around $18,000. So 15 plus 18, right? And roughly speaking, we're taking 10% share of the company. So we're giving them a $300,000 valuation up front. So when I say 3x to 7x, it's multiplied by that 300,000, which m some might argue is way too high. Um, but that's, that's how we do it, at least. Um, ours is also very similar. So we invest $25,000 plus all of our services, and we take 8%. Very good. Yeah, and also one more thing is we do common stock. So we come in fully aligned in terms of goals with the founders. So we, don't, we are only successful if the company is successful. Well, clearly this is a topic of, 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 of real importance to everyone here. I know I've benefited by it. I know this is an area that we st still have to look at in terms of what we can do as an institution to help foment this area um, in a combination perhaps of hard and soft money, how we can leverage off the Usamas, the angel networks, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a lot to do, but I, I do appreciate having the opportunity of meeting these gentlemen and hoping to, to network off of this. At this time, I would like to uh, thank the panel for their participation and for their thoughts. Uh, and we'll announce that after this, we will have a very short coffee break and then the uh, awards presentation. So gentlemen, thank you. Thank you.